Hello Biology 400 students. Welcome to another Biology 400 screencast. This is Mr. Gales and uh, today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about chemical reactions and equations. So we need to begin with understanding what a chemical reaction is and what a chemical equation is. First of all, chemical reactions involve making or breaking of bonds between different substances. The picture that you see on the screen represents the production of a bond between two monosaccharides, which are simple sugars. In the process of making that bond, there's a reaction called dehydration synthesis. You can see the water molecule that is being released. The water molecule, as it, as it leaves, is allowing for the bridge between these two molecules to form. In this case, the bridge is called a glycosidic linkage, and the molecule that forms is called a disaccharide. If we continue that reaction, do several more bonds like that, uh, we get a larger molecule called a polysaccharide that forms. These are molecules that you'll be learning a little bit about when we study organic chemistry in the weeks that follow. So what are chemical reactions or why are chemical reactions necessary for life? Well, there are three primary reasons in biology that we're going to look at chemical reactions. First, we know that they help to establish stable atomic structures. Uh, atoms desire the, the full outer shells, and, and when reactions occur, many times those stable atomic structures are produced. Also, new molecules that cells need are oftentimes formed by these chemical reactions. In the picture that you see here with the formation of the disaccharides and the polysaccharides, these are the kinds of reactions that are going on inside plant cells uh, right after photosynthesis so that they can produce, for instance, sucrose, which is a disaccharide that's used for transport of the sugars, and polysaccharides like starch, which is used for storage of the sugars. Finally, uh, chemical reactions allow cells to manage cellular energy. Um, Generally speaking, the rule is that when bonds break, energy is released. When bonds form, energy is stored. And so the making and breaking of bonds is, is sort of how energy is transferred through cells. All right, so when we look at a chemical reaction, it can be described by what we call a chemical equation. The chemical equation that you see on the screen here is one of the most important in all of life, in all of biology. This is the chemical equation for photosynthesis. Uh, looking at the equation, what, what kind of information can we tell? Well, we can look at this and tell the different elements involved in the equation. So I can see here that there's going to be some carbon and oxygen and some hydrogen involved in the photosynthesis reaction. I can also tell the number of atoms involved in each reaction. We're going to get to that in a minute, but I'm able to count up the total number of atoms and see you know, what's going on and what kind of matter is being transferred. Um, the different kinds of materials that are produced. And then finally, I can read you know, the reactants and products and have an understanding of what goes into the reaction and what comes out of the reaction. All right, so reading a chemical reaction is a little bit like translating it from symbols into words. The way you would read this reaction is that you have carbon dioxide and water reacting in the presence of sunlight and chlorophyll to produce carbohydrate and oxygen. Uh, the materials that you see here, light and chlorophyll, are not directly involved in the chemical reaction. They're not, in, as such, they're not reactants, but they are necessary for the reaction to occur. So we say in the presence of or along with. The materials that you see on the left-hand side of the arrow are the reactants. That's what goes into the reaction. The materials that are on the right-hand side are the products. What comes out of the reaction. All right, so other information that you can tell from looking at the chemical equation would be uh, when we see coefficients in front of some of the chemical formulas, what that tells us is the number of molecules of reactants and products that we see. So let's take a quick look. Uh, when you look at this equation, you see carbon dioxide. And there's a coefficient there, so that tells you that you have a certain number of molecules. How many molecules would you have? You would have six. How many molecules of water? Also six. Uh, next substance we have is carbohydrate. That's a product. How many molecules of the carbohydrate? In this case, we have only one. Anytime that there's no uh, coefficient placed in front of the formula, that just understood that there's only one molecule there. And then finally, we have also six molecules of oxygen. All right. Other information from the equation. If you take the subscript in each chemical formula and you multiply it by the coefficient of the, uh, for the number of molecules, uh, in that particular substance, that will tell you the number of each kind of atom on each side of the equation. So, 
what we're going to do is we're going to look at the different atoms that are on the reactant side and the different atoms that are on the product side. And we're going to count up the total number of atoms of each kind of element on each side. And hopefully we'll get that the numbers to balance. Hopefully they'll be even. All right, so for carbon, when we look at the reactant side with carbon, there are carbon atoms here and carbon dioxide. Each carbon dioxide molecule has one carbon atom, so I'm going to multiply that understood one times the coefficient six, and that's going to end up giving me six atoms of carbon on the reactant side. We go back over here to the product side, and you can see the only carbon that you find is here, and there are six atoms of carbon in each carbohydrate molecule. That's the formula for glucose. There's only one molecule. You can tell because the coefficient in front of there is just a 1. It's understood as a 1. So there are 6 on both sides, 6 carbons in the reactants and 6 carbons in the products. Uh, moving on to the oxygen atoms in the reactant side. Uh, when we look at the oxygen atoms here, there are 2 in each molecule of carbon dioxide times the 6 for this number of molecules. So 6 times 2 is 12. And then coming over here to the water, there's one atom in each water molecule, and there are six water molecules, so six times one is six. Add the two together, and you get 18. Hydrogen, finally, the only place we see hydrogen in the reactant side is right here. There's two atoms in each molecule of water times six molecules, and so we get a total of 12 atoms of hydrogen on the uh, reactant side. Again, we already looked at carbon. There are six carbon atoms here on the product side. We've got the one molecule of carbohydrate with six atoms of carbon in it. Oxygen, we're going to take a look over here. Oxygen, there are six oxygen atoms here in the one molecule. And there are two atoms in each oxygen molecule times six molecules. So there's 12 total over here. So we're going to end up with 18 total oxygen atoms in the products. And then finally, the hydrogen, the only place we see hydrogen is right over here. There are 12 of them in the carbohydrate molecule that's produced. There's just the one molecule, so we have 12. What you should notice is that the number of each kind of atom is the same on the reactant side as it is on the product side. That's very important. When those numbers are balanced the way they are, we say that that particular equation follows the law of conservation of matter. Law of conservation of matter states that in a chemical reaction, matter cannot be created or destroyed, but it may change form. So we see here carbon dioxide and water react together. We're not destroying any of the atoms. We're not creating any more atoms, but the atoms are going to be rearranged in such a way as they form a new substance, which is the carbohydrate glucose. They're also producing some oxygen gas. Now, one thing I want us to take a look at here is um, why we have to put coefficients in front of particular um, formulas in order to follow that law of conservation of matter. So I'm just going to get a pen real quickly here. And let's pretend like we could get rid of the coefficients and just have simply one molecule of each substance. All right. So we're going to cross those out. And we're going to come over here and do our, this is called an atom inventory, when you look at the number of atoms uh, on each side of the equation. So I got my carbon uh, on the reactant side. I just would have the one carbon here. And for my hydrogens, I would have two here. And then for oxygens, I would have the two from the carbon dioxide and the one from the water, so I'd end up with three oxygens. Coming over to the product side, you can see almost immediately that you're going to have some problems here. There's going to be six carbon atoms right, in the carbohydrate. There's going to be 12 hydrogen atoms. And then in terms of oxygen, we've got the six here and then another two over here, so there's eight of them. All right, so these numbers don't balance. So what's essentially happening, or what this would tell us, is in this reaction, without these coefficients here, if it wasn't balanced, what that would essentially imply is that in this reaction, matter was created. It came from nowhere. And obviously, that can't happen. So law of conservation of matter, what it does is it allows us to correctly uh, depict the total uh, amount of atoms on each side of an equation so that there is no either destruction or creation of matter. All right, so that is the quick little screencast here on reading chemical reactions and equations. And so on for now. Make sure again that you've taken any notes that you need. And uh, if you have any questions, bring those with you into class. All right, bye-bye.